Very warm greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let us turn to Joshua chapter 13 as we continue in it. Now from here, we are going to read about the division of the land. Last week, we learned from the beginning of the division in verse 14 of Joshua 13. Well, there was no division for the Levites. The Lord is their inheritance. We understood that. Then from here, from verses 15 to 32, what is it about? The poor chairman have to keep trying to pronounce the words rightly. Now, were you paying attention? What is it about? Now, verse 32 is clear. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of Jordan by Jericho eastward. So the record thus far is the inheritance, um, handing out of the inheritance on the eastern side of Jordan. That is what it was about. That is the record. Many details were given. But the question is, what is the significance that God is trying to bring across? You know, sometimes, maybe you have attended such meetings before where lawyers call family members to be present because it's a time to read the will and to hand out inheritance, okay? So imagine if you wrote your will and then you imagine, well, maybe when I'm not around and then my children, um, relatives or friends will be sitting there and they'll hear the will being um, read out to them, right? This land, this area, these things will belong to so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And, -so, and then you're just reading and reading and reading and you're sitting there listening. What goes through your mind? What is for me? What is for him? Now you will notice that Og, oh sorry, Sihon and Og was mentioned again. While talking about land, while talking about land, why mention the kings? What's the point? They are, they are dead. They are getting land. But you will notice for example, in verse um, 5, in talking about the land on the eastern side, um, sorry, not verse 5, um, in verse 15. Now, when talking about um, Reubens, the Reubenites, and you will see in verse 21, and all the cities and plain and all the kingdom of Sihon, Sihon, mention his name again. And then you would um, see another reminder of Sihon again and again. Now, why does God keep talking about Sihon? And you look Og in verse 30. In verse 30, reminded of Og. Then Og, the king of Bashan. And then in verse 31, Og in Bashan. Now, why does God want to mention them again and again because remember these kings they were mentioned in their psalms these kings are mentioned very often to the children of israel because they were the very strong and powerful kings you think about this god just described the eastern side of jordan and only two kings were mentioned it means that predominantly they were the superpowers they were very, very strong. They could repel and keep the enemies out of their land. Just two. Between the two of them, the entire western side controlled by them. So you think uh, how powerful they are. And all these years, no one could touch them. But when the children of Israel came along, they crumbled, although among them were giants. But they were easily destroyed, despite them having great chariots. We read about them and lots of horses the equivalent today of um, all the powerful equipment, military equipment that countries have. But yet, God says, they were toppled. Their lands were given to you. Now in hearing all these inheritances and then the mention, well, maybe you will hear, wow, you know, yes, you know, dad managed to have all this and then he managed to do such great businesses on earth and we have all this. Despite all the big companies, that was more powerful than them. Maybe you think of all that. 
So that is why they were mentioned. Now, but look at verse 20, um, if it, uh, verse 22. And there was a mention of Balaam also, the son of Beor, the soothsayer. Now, interesting, isn't it? Mention of very strong kings, but suddenly a mention of Balaam. Why? Why? Balaam was just another little um, soothsayer. Soothsayer are the people who would are basically sorcerers, diviners, all right? That's what they are. He's just a small prophet who wanted to be rich, who wanted to be powerful, just a little nobody. Why mention with Og and Sihon in inheritance giving time? Why? Now, if you were there and you knew the history, if you were there and receiving all this inheritance and you listen and you listen smiling, and then suddenly Balaam's name comes up, I think if you knew the history, it would send a shiver down your spine. It will evoke many memories in the midst of giving out the inheritance. Just the name Balaam. Balaam. Why? Now, Balaam's history with the eastern side of the conquest was not very long ago because this conquest, the major conquests are over, is giving out of land time. This conquest took seven years. So it's not very long ago on the other side as well. What would be fresh on these people's mind? What did Balaam do that God wants to bring him up at inheritance giving time? Now both powerful kings that many nations could not touch, they were tumbled by the children of Israel easily. Of course, by God's help, very clear. They could hardly touch and kill the children of Israel. Yes, we know when the children of Israel fell, there were some that died. But Balaam was one person, single-handedly. He caused 24,000 children of Israel to die. Og and Sihon put together, not even a small fraction of people of the children of Israel died. But Balaam achieved that. That is why the title today is Our Strongest Enemy. Who is it? What did Balaam do? That when the inheritance is being read, they hear the word Balaam and say, Oh, 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 we remember what happened. God is telling them, You know, children of Israel. Maybe you write your will. Make sure after I die, when you give out the land or when you give out inheritance, all right, lawyer or the person who executes my will, make sure you remind them of some things. Why? Because I want them to know we almost did not have any of this to inherit. When God talks about the eastern side and all this land, you look, look at verse 23. Look at verse 23. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben after their families, the cities, and the villages thereof. Then you look at verse 28. And this is the inheritance of the children of God after their families, cities, and their villages. Now God says, you know you have all these families and cities and villages. But please know, you almost did not have anything. Don't talk about crossing over to the western side of Jordan. When you're inheriting this land, you almost had nothing. Now is peace time. You are getting the land. But please don't forget Balaam. Who is Balaam? What did he do? That should send shivers down our spine today as well. Is he just an Old Testament person that God mentioned once? No, please know, in the New Testament, God mentions Balaam repeatedly as well to the New Testament church. In the book of Jude, he's mentioned. Now turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. So is Balaam worth mentioning to us today? Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Now 
Now, God here is talking to a New Testament church, the Pagamos church. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. A New Testament church, the church of Pergamos, they fell. Is Pergamos church today around? No more. They did not heed the warning. But the same sin can ha that happen that Balaam taught Balak. That sin even in the New Testament continued. That doctrine, in fact, God says the doctrine of Balaam continued even when Balaam is dead and New Testament church fell. Will it happen to you as an individual, to your family, to us as a church? Will it? Who is Balak? What is the history? Why must God bring this up? Because no one could touch the children of Israel, but Balak managed to. Balak, Balak, the king Balak on the other side, he wanted to destroy the children of Israel as they were passing by, so they were coming through. He knew, I want to kick these people out. He knew that these people would take over the land. And he called Balaam, the soothsayer, as you know, to curse Israel. Balaam was a diviner, not a believer, all right? The Bible is clear about that. So Balaam tried, tried and tried, but he could not. God, he wanted to curse Israel, you know the story. Only words of blessing came out. And God says, don't you dare curse Israel. Israel is my chosen people. They will possess the land. I have a purpose for them. Balaam could not use sorcery to destroy Israel. Finally, Balak gave I say, I give up on you, useless soothsayer, useless diviner. Balaam himself knew, I can't fight against this God. But, but, what happened? What happened? Now turn to Numbers. Now the reason why we need to know the history is because the doctrine of Balaam is so powerful. It destroyed believers, almost destroyed Israel. And God brought him up at this inheritance giving time. Turn to the book of Numbers. Now, if you did not read the New Testament revelations, you would not know what Balaam did. Numbers 25, sorry. Numbers 25. Turn to Numbers 25. Numbers 25. Now, verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to, number 1, commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Verse 2. And they call. And here's God saying to them, and they called people in unto the sacrifices of their gods. So the daughters of Moab taught the children of Israel to sacrifice to their gods. And the people did eat. Eat what? Eat things. Sacrifice to the idols. And bowed down their, to their gods. And verse 3, and Israel joined themselves to Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. Now, in Numbers 31, that, uh, sorry, in verse 9, if you look at verse 9, and there, and, and God sent a plague, basically, God sent a plague, and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000, 24,000. Now, what did Balak manage to do? Balak told, uh, sorry, Balaam taught Balak something. He said, Now, there is no use. No one, even you and all, you and Sihon and Og combined will ever be able to kill even one Israelite. The only thing that I know will work without you lifting a hand to fight with them. You know what? Make them sin against their God. If you are able to make them sin against their God, you don't have to do anything. Theirs is a holy God. Theirs is a righteous God. And when his people sin, he will also chastise them. When they 
fell. How did they fall? He says, Sen. Now you go send the daughters of Moab. Later on you read in, in Numbers 21, Midianitish women as well. You send them, seduce them, allure them, get them into an equal yoke, get them to commit fornication with them, and get these women to encourage them to eat food offered to idols and introduce Baal Peor to them. You see, fighting is no use. You infiltrate, you go in, into, you send your people within them and make them like these things. And the moment they do that, God will step in. The plague killed 24,000 people. What Balaam realized, and there are Balaams today. There were Balaams in the New Testament church that God talked about. There were doctrines of Balaam. Now the Christian must then ask, what should I beware of? What can happen to me? When can this happen to me as well? Do not forget, God is bringing this up to say you almost did not have any inheritance, let alone you cross over to the western side of Jordan. And this is not a Balaam that is dead and no longer be able to influence you. Churches have been destroyed by Balaam. The strength of Balaam is this. His ability to allure, seduce you to sin and to make you look at things in a way which doesn't look like sin. What was the strength of Balaam? Now, the New Testament tells us there were a few things, actually Numbers 25 as well. Number one, cause, cast a stumbling block. There's a doctrine of Balaam, his ability to cast a stumbling block. Number two, to eat things offered to idols. Number three, commit fornication. Number four, in the Old Testament, bow, join yourself to Baal Peor. Now, what are all this? The children of Israel strength that they remembered seeing these people die in front of their own eyes. 24,000 just hit with plague, maybe like COVID-19 COVID today. You know, just witnessing hundreds of thousands of people just dying instantly or sick with very terrible illnesses. They saw that. What is Balaam's allurement? Now, one, cast a stumbling block. What is that about? What is that about? A stumbling block is to cause you to fall, very clearly, cause you to fall. Nothing can cause you to fall except when you yourself give in to the seduction. Balaam can only cast that stumbling block. Everywhere you're walking, know this. The Balaams today, well, obviously it's the world. They were constantly cast through media, through magazines, through philosophies of the world, through all sorts of ideas to make the Christian fall. Now, but he must know what you like. All of us have our own weaknesses. For them, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Now, these people, they have, for 40 years in the wilderness, now they have not seen much, all right? They have not seen much. And for them to see the Midianitish women, to see the Moabish woman, they will say, wow, they're very different. Maybe some of us are like today, all right? You men or even women, wow, the guys today, they, are, they look very different, they have very different ideas, they're very attractive, they're very worldly wise. You know, not like our 
boring church girls. They will see them dressed very differently. Not like these very conservative Israelite women that we are used to. Not like these conservative Israelite women that is constantly praying, reading the Word of God, looking after the home. No, they are very exciting. Maybe for you too. As men, you are attracted to such women. Say, ah, church women, all so square. You know, the teenagers dress like old ladies. Maybe you women or you young girls, you say, yeah, our church guys are just so, so square and so boring. Oh, these are the churches, these are the people. These people of the world, they are so much more exciting. Look at the places they go to, the things they talk about, the places they visit, the lifestyle they have. They are so exciting. So for these people, you have to know they are a new world open to them. You say, wow, very different. There was an attraction. And the children of Israel were warned many times. In the book of Deuteronomy, before they cross over, God already said, now make sure you do not fall into unequal yoke. Make sure of that. Because they will steal your children away. They will steal your heart away from me. Balaam knew very well. If you can make them get into unequal yoke, you can get them to worship your gods. The moment they worship your gods as well, they will be finished. That is why God says they have joined themselves unto Baal Peor. Now, there are many gods of this world. They mean Baal Peors. What is Baal Peor? Baal Peor is their cult, cult god of fertility. That is what Baal Peor represent, represented. So the fertility means, well, they sacrifice to them. Um, they can have more children. They can have more fertile land. So now they know they have to start tilling the land. More fertile um, um, land which means more fruitful land. They will reap more. They will have lots more. So now they begin to forget their purpose in the land. So he said, now introduce Baal Peor to them because Baal Peor will draw them away from their purpose to let's just have more and more and more and pursue more. Now even if at the expense, God says, now they bow down to their gods, meaning to say you live under their burden. You submit yourself to them. Yes, we are worshipping Jehovah, but you know, Jehovah is not enough. We add these things into our life to make sure that my job will be better, my children will be more successful, my health will be better. Whatever it is, as long as it promises that, well, I will also live for those things, submit to those things. Well, the world says it's foolish for us to live as Christians. Same for them. Yeah, actually, it's true. You have to understand now, these women that go there, they will begin to them, you know, you know, our Baal Peor, all this while, look at our side, Og and Sihon and Balak and all that. We were so fruitful. You want to continue to be like that? The world tells you the same thing. You want to continue, you want to be fruitful, you want to be successful in your job, in your studies? You have to live like us. You have to subscribe to our ideas. Fly in, fly out. That is what is going to get you more money. Spending so much time in church studying the Word of God. No, 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 no. Your children need to have more tuition. Your children need to pursue more things. Have more networking. Your children must have all this. No, no, no. You need to have this. It's fine. You can worship Jehovah. But you know, all these things from our experience are very important. But our PR. That's the same in church. The problem with this sin was the sin of compromise. You worship Jehovah, that's fine, carry on, but also accept and worship and take in 
These are the things that can make you a great church. Now, we want to reach many people, without a doubt. The church must reach out. The church must grow, spiritually especially. We want to be relevant. Yes, we want to be. But the thing is this. We must not fall into the doctrine of Baal Peor. God has given us an inheritance. We have a sound church. We are, there are things that we are doing for God. But you must remember the temptation, the temptation to grow wrongly. Let's be relevant. Let's have that kind of music. Let's have that kind of talk. Let's have that kind of sermons. Let's have that, let's have that kind of worship. Let's have that kind to attract the compromise, the spiritual compromises, the doctrinal compromises. Well, today many churches accept. They accept things that are blatantly sinful. God talks about it. Such lifestyles are sinful. God talks about what is the family model for the husband, for the wife. Mothers to be keepers at home. Fathers to lead spiritually, not to be passive. Children to be obedient. But today, all this are openly taught in other churches as that is square, old-fashioned, too strict. Now, there are these things that the world says, the Baal Peors. You incorporate those into your church, you stop talking about these things, you will grow. You will grow. That's the temptation, always. As individuals, the same. You see, that is why the New Testament church fell. God says in Revelation, I have few things against you because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Thou hast there those that hold. What is God talking about? Now, if you look at the previous verse, God says now, you are a wonderful church. You hold fast to sound faith. And you are willing to die for the faith. Amazing, right? Pergamos. But God says, I'm against you. You have among you those people. What is God saying? We allow, we allow those that subscribe to the doctrines of Baal, Balaam, to be in the church. You allow those that subscribe to the doctrines of Balaam in your home. You allow those practices in your children. You allow. God says you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. It is not simply about teaching. It is not simply about, well, we can ape and we can say all those things. It is the practice that is crucial. So know that at the time when the land was being given out, God says you must remember only recently you 24,000 people died. Not because Og and Sahong were strong, but because of Balaam. You let Balaam's device enter your life, your home, and your church. That is what will destroy you. Please remember that. You have the land. Don't forget that. Don't ever allow the Balaam's strategy to ever occur among you again. What is this? Eating food offered to idols. So God says, I have something against you. You have those that would eat food offered to idols. What is that about? And in the Old Testament, God said them to them as well. Now, when they eat food offered to idols in those days, and even now, many people eat food offered to idols. Now, it's the understanding that idols, their gods, are also powerful. They can make a difference. So the food offered to them has some inherent benefit. So they say, well, we worship Jehovah, but you know, they have their sacrifices. 
And if we eat of their sacrifices, which the, the women will bring and you say, oh, you know, eat this as well, have this as well, it will help your, your people. They would then say, oh, this will also make us fertile. Maybe, you know, I want my wife to have more children. Eat, eat, wife. Maybe I want my land to bear more mangoes. Eat, eat more. Now, there's a concept. Instead of depending on God and trusting in God, they believe that eating of those things means trusting in their God, it will make a difference as well. Isn't it the same today? It's the same. Same Balaam's theology. Trusting God alone is no use. You must trust in your degree. Now, I'm not saying degrees are not important. God made them fight the battle. They still need to fight. You must trust in your health. You must trust in these exercises. You must trust in all these things, in your investment. That is what you must trust in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Believe in God as well. That is why they eat food offered to idols. Is it the same today? Yeah, we can teach all the doctrine of biblical separation and all the holy doctrines and all that. But actually, in our life, we do not trust in God alone. We still cling on to many things that we believe. These are the things secretly behind our back. These are the things I make sure that in my service to God, in my following of God, these things don't get affected. Because if they do, I'm not, I will not survive. You still have that. What is another thing about eating food offered to idols? As we know, God says you must not have any business dealings with them. Means enter into, um, strike hands with them, enter into um, business dealings that will now begin to make you work in businesses like them. You are different. In order to, in those days, cut a contract, literally, they will cut an animal and they will eat together. And very often, they are food are offered to idols because to them that is very important and what you eat with them now as long as you don't eat food offered to idols you cannot make a contract enter into a business contract with them and god says you do not trust in them you trust in me i will provide for you so when god says they taught you to eat food offered to idols it, is, it means that. Now, we begin to integrate with the world. We do business like the world. We trust in riches and investment like the world. And we think that these things are so crucial. So when God says, now you cause them to eat food offered to idols, it means now you begin to assimilate their ways. That is what it is. Live like them. Trust in them. Have them among you. Now, to eat the food offered to idols means this. They accepted. They embraced their thinking. They embraced them as people that they need to also depend on and trust in. What do I mean by that today? Because the same Balaam doctrine caused Pergamos to fall. Will this doctrine cause us, cause you, cause your family to fall? Now, many have actually studied the Word of God, have grown, have known sound doctrine. But over time, as you grow, you begin to listen to the world. You begin to read how the world lives, you begin to have people telling you, no, 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 you know, you should live like that and like this. Initially, we think, no, we should not. We should live holy lives, godly lives, obey the Lord at all costs, even if it means it looks like it may affect my lifestyle, my livelihood. No, I still need to obey God. Now, initially, it's like that. But over time, you begin to listen, you begin to say, mm, I think it makes sense. And worst of all, over time, God says, you have them among you. Meaning to say, you begin to come to church or maybe start at home. 
you begin at home to say, you know, family, we, we don't need to be so serious about God. We don't need, you know. We should be a, more, a bit more relaxed with our children, with our lifestyle, with our pursuits. Now, the one thing that began to cause Christianity to fall in C.H. Spurgeon time, I've said before, is this downgrade, where churches used to obey the Lord, they had meetings in church to study the Word of God, and it's constantly focused around the Word, prayer, as family, as church. But then the world began to say, you know, people must have rest and recreation. Is it true? Yes. But to the point, they say, don't, we should not make people go to church to study the Word of God a few times. They are, they are already hearing the Word on Sunday. We don't need to have prayer meetings. Now, back then, their prayer meetings was every night. I'm not saying that we need to. We only have it once a week. Now, even those, you know, tell people it's up to them. They need family time. Then they begin to listen because the world keeps saying, there must be recreation, there must be relaxation. Then your children will be all-rounded. Then your health will be good. So you say, Christians must have this as well. And then they begin to fight against, they begin to imbibe Balaam's doctrines and they begin to fight against church. You know, too many meetings. And the church began to crash. You see, Balaam knew the external things cannot cause you as an individual. There's no temptation, no sin strong enough to cause you to fall. It is only when you begin to accept, listen, that is what happened. Now, that's the saying. You cannot cause the bird to fly over your head, right? But you can always stop it from building a nest on your head. Isn't it true? Temptations can come. Allurements can come. But it's only if you allow it. So in reality, who is the greatest and strongest enemy? Yourself. Balaam can only throw these things in your way. Stumbling blocks. The stumbling block of unequal yoke. God repeatedly warned them. But Balaam knew this would be the Achilles heel, so to speak. This would be the one thing that will destroy their lives. They will be drawn away. See, Balaam actually knew theology very well. Are you in such a relationship? Because this is how it began with the Moabite, with the Midianitish woman. That's what God says. Now, the problem is this. You see, the things that Balaam brought along, they are very um, earthly in the eyes of men. Right? Well, it's just a relationship. Just a relationship. Just, just a woman or just a man. That's all. What, what has it to do with inheritance, my, my walk with the Lord? You see, it's delinked. The children of Israel delinked that. They forgot that if they fall into this unequal yoke, God will judge them. And then their purpose will, will, be, will fail. They will be derailed. So you don't link. Today is the same. Balaam is able to slip this into your life without you linking. My Christian walk, my future family will be derailed. Now, churches are also foolish enough to think there's nothing wrong in an unequal yoke. Your church don't marry you, we'll marry you. Your church don't accept this lifestyle, we accept it here. But it all looks like to them, all right? You imagine the man say, oh, very beautiful woman, very nice lady, actually. Not that bad, right? What about food offered to idols? It's just about having more. That should be, what is wrong with having more in life? Nothing wrong. You see, it's very earthly, that's all. Just like you say, having a better job, is that wrong? No, we always say it's not wrong. But the question is, what do you do? What would you compromise in order to do that job in terms of spirituality? But see, it's just all earthly things. You don't link it. 
Which is why at the giving of the inheritance, God brought up Balaam. Please don't look at what Balaam brought into Israel as just earthly happenings. Just our daily life. Meet people, want to get married, work, want to have more money. That is all. No. The New Testament church fell also. What is wrong? We want more people. It's just music. It's just saying that this lifestyle are okay. More people will come. Maybe we'll get to hear the gospel. More people will hear the gospel. What's wrong? See, many of those things are just based on our earthly side. We don't see behind. They did not see behind the strategy, the seduction, the plan of Balaam and Balak. They did not see that. Now, one of the things that is very painful always for churches to see are families that got their inheritance, so to speak, all right? Meaning to say, in the past, their lives were disobedient, and then, or as an individual even, a disobedient life, and then they came to know more of scriptures, and then they had many victories in life. God helped them to go through very difficult periods in the family, to go through very difficult periods in their personal walk as, a, as, a, as an individual, and God helped them through that. And then now they are like the children of Israel standing there, and God says, your inheritance. In other words, now many things, because of your repentance, many things are here for you. You can now move to the next stage of your Christian life. Just like the children of Israel, the next phase was a wonderful phase. No more battles, not that no more battles. Now they just need to continue to clean up the land. And the rest of the time, they just spend now living their life as a testimony on earth, living out God's commandment on earth. Nothing can stop them. They are at that phase, just crossing that phase into that life. That is when God says, please remember Balaam. And many Christians must, well, I would say that we must realize, when does Balaam work? When? When are we most vulnerable? When? It is the time like the children of Israel. God is about to move you to a new level of spiritual work, to a new level of usefulness, whether as an individual, whether as a family, whether as a church, that is when he will work. That is when Satan will send him along. What do I mean by that? You must know, now the children of Israel, their antennas will be down. Meaning to say, the major of Bashan, all these major kings, the giants on both sides, they are defeated. Now it's just an easy path. Their sensitivity to sin will be lowered because now they are in position of power. They are in a good spiritual position. Now, that is when it's most dangerous. Same for the church, same for the individual. Maybe you have, well, gone through many difficult battles as a student. Finally, I'm graduating. I'm coming out to work. I've experienced God's help by faith. Maybe same as a working person. You went through many difficult challenges in your job. And then you see how God helped you through it. Maybe as a family, bringing up children, Godly said, you experienced that. Maybe as an individual that got out of a certain illness, you now experience that growth. Maybe as a family, now you're moving on. Remember the name Balaam. Remember the doctrines of Balaam. That is what God is saying here. In the giving out of inheritance, happy time, right? Please make sure your antennas are very sensitively scanning for the doctrines of Balaam through your friends, through the world, through your job, through things that now will begin to allure you. That is what is going to happen. The when, the when is the key. So when you read all this, you must realize that. Now the thing is, so what should I do? What should I do? 
Well, I know these challenges. Now the interesting thing is this. Did you notice something? Look at chapter 13, all right? Now verse 14, God already talked about the Levites. God already said, all right, Levites, you will have no land inheritance. I'm your inheritance. All right, Levites, we learned that last week. Then he talked about Manasseh, Reuben, Gad, which is on the eastern side. But see how God closes the eastern side of the inheritance giving. See how God ends this in verse 33. Now, he says, but, now after he talks about verse 32, the eastward side, but unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. You see, a repeat of verse 14. Why does God come back to the Levites again? When he talked about the eastern side and when he brought up Levi, for another important reason. Just at a, 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 um, a fear that would run through their spine when they hear the name Balaam, God would now bring up the Levites. And then, then there is again the clarity, the comfort. Why? Why? Now, the, how did the case of Balaam deceiving through Balak, the children of Israel, how did the plague stop? Some of you are familiar, some of you are not. You see, God wanted to bring it back to the Levites. It stopped because of the Levites. You remember Balaam? What should you do? Remember the Levites. Remember the Levites. Now turn again, please, to, uh, well, say, turn to uh, Numbers chapter 31, all right? Numbers chapter, oh, sorry, 25. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers 25. How did the problem of Balaam got resolved? Chapter 25. Quickly. Now in verse 5, God's, and Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. So that instruction is given. Everyone that fallen for the ploy of Bala, ba Balaam, kill them. Number 2, um, at that time, verse 6, And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of congregation. What is happening? Here, while the people were weeping, while God just gave the commandment to kill, they were in repentance. They were in resolving the problem. Here, this Israelite man. In fact, this Israelite man in chapter 31, we are told he's one of the princes of the tribe of Simeon, one of the princes, okay, a leader. He brought this Midianitish woman. This Midianitish woman in chapter 31, also we are told that she was a princess, a princess of a ruler of the other side, the enemy side. Now he brought, he just brought this woman in front of all the people, weeping in repentance, brought him before Moses, in the sight of Moses, and in front of the tabernacle. Amazing. Now what happened? Verse 7. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the men of Israel into the tent. Ha ha, they were found in the tent. What do you think they're doing? God says fornication was the problem. What else? And thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. Did not go beyond 24,000. Now notice the spear went through. The man and the woman, their bodies were together. And it went through her belly. This is a euphemistic way of describing what they were doing. You imagine, in the midst of the repentance, 
in the midst of sin being dealt with, there was this man who would do that. Is it different from today? No. The church continues to teach. The church continues to preach about what is wrong, what is right, whether it's the family model, whether it's music, whether it is unequal yoke. There will be those in church that will be like this man. And you are, if you are that, you have fallen for the doctrine of Balaam, where you think, I don't care. The church can keep saying, Moses can keep saying, can keep dealing with all these things. I don't care. I just want this. What's wrong with this? She's a nice woman. She's a princess, you know. You know, if I married a princess, do you know what it means for Israel? Some parents think like that as well. You know, marry a doctor, marry a uh, whatever, a lawyer. Do you know what that means? Marry an engine, whatever. You know what that means to our, our, our family name. We never had that before. And you think, it's just a relationship. That's all. I don't care. I'm just going to do it. I don't care if church teaches about this family more. I'm just going to do it. And I'll just keep coming to church. I'll walk into the tent of tabernacle with this lifestyle, with this disobedience. Now, I'm not saying you do not bring unbelievers to church, all right? You say, oh, from now onwards, cannot bring unbelievers to church. You come, pastor might slay them. You should not be in a relationship with them. You bring unbelievers to church. But this man had all the full intention to cohabit, to be in an equal yoke. So God says the act, look at verse 7, Numbers 25, verse 7. Now notice how God brings it up. And Phinehas, who is Phinehas? The son of Eliezer, whom we know is a priest. Who is Eliezer? The son of Abraham, Aaron, the priest. The priesthood. The priesthood did the right thing and stopped the doctrine of Balaam from continuing. In fact, verse 11, and the son, uh, for it um, is repeated, Luke 7 and 8 and 11. Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel. Can you see the repeating emphasis on the Levites. That is why God closed this part up with the Levites again, reminding them what Balaam did. But also please remember what Phinehas did. You must learn from that. Meaning to say, deal with sin in your own life. Deal with sin in your family. Leaders, deal with sin in the church. Do not let them continue Pergamos fell because they held up sound doctrines. They were even willing to die for doctrines, but they allowed unsound practices and let the people live those kind of lifestyle. Now, Fini has the priesthood. This calls and to remembrance the heads of the home. You are the priest of your home. What's happening to you? Are you letting your wife live the way she wants to? Are you letting your children live the way they want to? Are you letting them, letting those things into their lives? Because you're afraid to offend them. Because you're afraid that it will cause quarrels with you and your wife. Because you're afraid that your children will not like you. Let them be. Parents often say that. You don't understand, Pastor. They, they will get angry. Phinehas speared a prince the son of a leader in Israel. Did he worry about that? What would the tribe say? Would they turn against him? He did what was needed. So fathers, are you passive? You look at your own homes. What is in your children's television programs, computers? What do you allow? Nah, just small things. Remember, Balaam made it look like a small thing. Let that into their lives first. Let them sin against God. Let them be in an equal yoke because that will destroy them. Satan knows he doesn't need to destroy you. He just need God, need you to sin against God and he can let God chastise you and make you useless. Same 
for the individual. What are you allowing into your life? You are part of a royal priesthood. What are you allowing secretly that no one sees, no one knows? You can be like the Pergamos church outwardly, very holy, very godly, but behind you tolerate and allow all kinds of sins in your life. You do FEBC courses, you can answer all the questions, but behind you allow. The problem is allowing. Balaam, no, just get them to allow these people in their midst, allow these sins, these sins into their life. Allow. And God will deal with them. Now this was a historic moment. Remember that in the children's, children of Israel's life. The reminder is why they fell, and the, and the reminder is what prevented it from getting worse. Are you going to deal with it? Now, in closing, I want to say this. Sometimes I wonder what will happen in church. Maybe you parents, sometimes you wonder, what will happen at home? Maybe you as an inv individual, I wonder what will happen in my life if I were to behave like Phinehas, what would happen? If I dealt with these sins, the world will say, come, come and eat with us. Come for a drink with us after work. It's just a small thing. You, you want to be part of the business? Come. I'm not saying you cannot go eat with them, but you have a drink. What places you go to? It's a small thing. Well, why do we keep harping about drinking? Yeah, it's fine. But what will happen if I deal like Phineas of whatever it is in secret that I'm playing with? What will it happen? What will happen? Maybe as a family. Now, if I deal with the sins in my home, it will be third world war. My wife will be unhappy. My children will be unhappy. Maybe I'll just leave it alone. Fail as Phineas. You must be Phineas in church. I think it's the best time to teach these things. Now, I wonder, one day, if a church member says, I'm going to marry an unbeliever, and the church says, we cannot condone that. We will counsel, we will help. But once you decide to marry, the church cannot marry you. In fact, the church needs to excommunicate you. This is exactly what was happening. The killing was excommunication from the tribe of Israel. Commandment by God. Today we don't kill, huh? please, no. We excommunicate. And when that happens, what would the congregation say? So severe, especially as a leader or leader's child. So severe. But God says, because of Phinehas' zeal, he was zealous for my sake among them that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. God says, because of the Holiness, the, the zeal for holiness. Phinehas did exactly what God did. Phinehas felt as exactly what God felt, the holy anger. Phinehas knew exactly the seriousness of what was happening. Fathers, do you feel that? Or you're more afraid of offending? Individuals, do you feel that? Are we more afraid of offending a boss? What would the church, how would the church react? Just know, that is what God expects. We don't like to do that. We do all we can to redeem. Moses already was doing all he could to redeem, but this person just walked up and said, I don't care. Then it has to be dealt with. Why were the children of, why were the Levites, do you ever thought, do you ever think, why were the Levites not given land? They say, oh, because of this, right? God says, God says they won't give land. No. The Levites, the, um, Levite, the son of Jacob, was actually cursed by Jacob because of their sin, of overslaying, Jacob cursed them. He said, you will not get land when you reach the place. So long time ago, Jacob already said that. It was because a curse was set on the Levites. So before they went to the promised land, they already know we are cursed. But God made it clear, at the time of the golden calf, 
When Moses said, Who is on the Lord's side? Who will come over and slay every man his brother that worship the golden calf and would not repent? The Bible made it very clear in Exodus. The Levites, God said the Levites, they came across and they stood with Moses. And God says, they are set apart. The reason why they don't have a land was because they are cursed. The reason why now God says, now I will now bless you is because they chose to deal with sin. Whatever it took, whoever it was, they were willing to stand with God. And in Numbers 21, God made an eternal covenant with Phinehas. He said, because of this thing that you did, you have proven that you will deal with sin. Fathers, will you? Individuals, will you? Church, will we? Because you have proven that you will deal with sin, now I make an eternal covenant with you that your descendant will always be serving me as priests. Do you understand that? That is why the curse was turned into a blessing. If you deal with sin, the curse will turn into a blessing. Will you be on the Lord's side? That is the question. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 400 and six. Who is on the Lord's side? Four zero six. Four hundred and six.